I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is February 26th, 2021. This meeting is held in accordance of Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Hanson, Rick. Hanson, Rick, aye. Present, uh, Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, present. Heinzen and Josh. Present. Aiko and Patty. Present. Ackland, Susan. Ackland, present. Backer, Jeff. Backer, present. Beckerfin, Jamie. Present. Eklund, Rob. Present. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, present. Green, Steve. Present. I go, Spencer. I go, present. Jordan, Sydney. Jordan, present. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, Keeler present. Lee, Fu. Lee, present. Lippert, Todd. Lippert, Todd. Lewick, Dale. Lewick, present. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison, Kelly. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson, present. Nelson, present. Tice, Tama. Present. President, and a quorum is present. The next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes um, from, from Thursday, February 25th, 2021. Um, Representative Heinzman, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Having reviewed the minutes, Madam Chair, I would move them. Representative Heinzman moves approval of the minutes for February 25th, 2021. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Um, first up on the agenda today is um, House File 696. Representative becker Fenn, will you move that the House File 696 first engrossment be recommended to be placed in the general register? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. Representative becker Fenn, to your bill. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, House File 696 uh, involves uh, certain data that the Department of Natural Resources keeps about minors. It's actually a pretty short and straightforward bill. We already heard it in uh, in my committee in judiciary. I uh, essentially make sure that the data that is being uh, kept about um, from about minors, for instance, when they apply for a license or take training, um, that that minor is that uh, minor data is kept uh, non-public. Uh, as far as access to that data. Um, I do have uh, someone from the DNR, uh, Colonel Rodman Smith is here from the DNR if members have questions, but I'm, I'm actually not sure if there's any more to say about uh, the bill itself. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. Um, I don't know if folks have questions. I know Bob Meyer is here from DNR as well. Representative Heinzman, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, the bill is pretty straightforward, but it always begs the question when one of these uh, kinds of uh, data protection bills comes forward, uh, what triggered uh, that bill being written to begin with. So I'm hoping that uh, maybe someone from DNR could confirm that uh, this is just preemptive, uh, that we're not gonna see come some kind of story in the news. And then also, I'm also, wondering um, my notes here, uh, what other areas would DNR be collecting data on minors? Is this the only area that would have this sensitive information or is it just hunting licenses? Uh, I know Madam Commissioner, Chair. Commissioner Meyer. Uh, good morning members for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. And thank you for the question, Representative Heinzman. This issue has been coming in front of us uh, for the past several years, we've had several requests in the past about information related to minors that we've redacted. Um, we haven't been sued on that, but we didn't want to share that information as well. So we're trying to codify in statute what our current practice is, protecting any information related to minors. We contain firearm safety data, uh, off-road recreational vehicle training safety data, snowmobile, ATV, things like that. And also I can through our parks programs, when people register that information is, is, is saved. We wanna be able to protect all that data and we appreciate 
the support we've been receiving on this issue today. So I hope that answers your question. Representative Heitzman. So I'll try again. Is there any other places where DNR is collecting this kind of sensitive data other than a hunting license? And then also, has there been a loss of data? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, or Madam Chair, I'm sorry if I wasn't explicit enough. We do have other data such as our ATV safety training records, our snowmobile safety training records, things of that nature that we collect that is non-hunting data. There has not been a breach, but we wanna make sure that we protect this data to the highest degree possible uh, going forward. And that's the intention of this bill. This bill was in front of the set legislature last year as well, but due to the situations that occurred after deadline, uh, we weren't able to, to move the bill forward to final passage. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. That was, uh, yep, that was what I needed. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, next up, I see Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, rep um, represent Commissioner Meyer, um, roughly, do you have an idea of um, like the ATVs and the gun, um, how many individuals have you collected that data on? Are, are we looking like for with license for guns and hunt, I mean, for hunting and so forth, do you have like 200,000 on ATVs? Do you have that information handy? Or Commissioner Meyer. Madam Chair, Representative Backer, I do not. I can easily pull that information together for you by type. It's quite a bit, right? If you look at, you're required to have firearm safety. You can get it when, take the class when you're 11. It doesn't become effective till you're 12. All of the youth that are hunting between 12 and 18 right now, um, that would be that's a big number, which is great. We're really excited about that, right? But I, I'll get you some of that information. I'll, I'll pull together a table that shows uh, firearm safety, ATV, snowmobile, and some of the other categories that we have just at a very granular high level and share that with the committee. I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah, that would be appreciated. That way we know what we're working with. Um, you know, this is good that we're trying to be proactive instead of like um, Representative Heinzman would say, see something in the newspaper and we have to play damage control. All right, members, any further discussion? Not seeing any hands up. Um, Representative Becker, Finn, any closing remarks here? Yep, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would appreciate members' support. I will just note that this bill is being carried by Senator Rood uh, in the Senate and is already on second reading over there. Um, it's really straightforward. The real question is, should this data about minors be kept non-public? And, and I think that's a pretty easy question to answer. Would appreciate members' support and will renew my motion. Representative becker Finn renews her motion that House File 696, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. The clerk will take the roll on the motion. Wazowick, Amy. Wazowick, I. Wazowick, I. Hi, Tim and Josh. I. Hi, Tim and I. Akum, Patty. I. Akum, I. Ackland, Susan. I. Ackland, I. Backer, Jeff. Backer, I. Backer, I. Becker, Finn, Jamie. I. Becker, Finn, I. Eklund, Rob. I. Eklund, I. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, I. Uh, Green, Steve. I. Green, I. I go, Spencer. I go, I. I go, I. Jordan, Sydney. Jordan, I. Jordan, I. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, I. Keeler, I. Lee, Fu. Lee, I. Lee, I. Lippert, Todd. Uh, Lewick, Dale. Lewick, I. Lewick, I. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson, I. Nelson, I. Tice, Tama. I. Uh, Tice. Sorry. Tice, I. Tice, I. Uh, 17 eyes and zero notes. The motion prevails and House File 696 is on its way to the General Register. Um, next up on the agenda today is House File 695. Um, Representative Becker Finn, will you move that House File 695 be recommended to be re referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Finance and Policy Committee? So moved, Madam Chair. Representative Becker Finn, to your bill. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This one is a little bit more complicated than the last one. Um, so this is a bill we we had before us last biennium as well, and it has to do with uh, updating our laws related to off road uh, recreational vehicles and boats um, when people are driving those vehicles under the influence. And uh, I will turn this over to the DNR to walk through the bill. All right, and it looks like we have Mr. Smith here to do that. If you, Colonel Smith, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and begin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Colonel Rodman Smith, I'm the Director of Enforcement at the Department of Natural Resources. Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, I'll thank you, Representative Becker Finn, for bringing this forward again this year for us. Um, as the Representative Becker Finn said, this was before this committee. It also made it through Chair Mariani's committee. And then, unfortunately, uh, with the pandemic, um, this is one of the many, many bills last year that uh, didn't really get much movement after that. So uh, much of this language is the same. So what this is, is a DUI conformity bill. And maybe to frame this for this committee, um, since it is a natural resource committee, uh, anglers have a saying, uh, if you catch them, you clean them. And so uh, a few years ago, uh, unfortunately, we had a tragic incident where uh, a young man up in Chisago area was killed by an intoxicated snowmobiler. And at that time, the legislature uh, did some work. and on the criminal side of, of DUI made all DUIs the same. And so whether you're driving a snowmobile, an ATV, a minivan, a motorcycle, a lawnmower, the criminal side is all the same. What this bill does is it makes that conformity now post arrest, post conviction, the same too. And so it's just conforming so that all the way through this process, DUIs are treated the same no matter what they are. And so. The catch them part, I guess you could say, would be the criminal part of it. And all the clean them side is the post arrest, post conviction. And that's and that's what this bill does is make sure that there's conformity. So it looks like a lot of change, um, but uh, the revisor did a great job and decided that um, it was easier just to repeal a few sections and just start over um, rather than try to make a lot of changes. And so that's why it looks like it's a lot of work. So I'll walk through it real quick, Madam Chair, um, so folks have an understanding. Um, so section one is actually uh, has a lot of old language because in the repealer, uh, cha chapter 8491 is being repealed. And so this is the rewrite of it. And so um, if you look at section one, if we start on lines 1.13 to 1.14 definitions, those are kind of old and they refer back to 169A, which is DUI statute. And so you'll see 169A a lot in this. Um, subdivision two on lines 1.15 to 1.9, that is old language from the repealed um, 8491. Same with lines 120 to 122, that is old language. When we get into lines 123 to 124, that is conformity language that talks about the suspension of, of uh, driving privileges. That is new, that is conforming language. Uh, if you turn the page to 2.2 or 2.3 to 2.5, um, that is also conforming language and basically what that says is the P Department of Public Safety will be sending out a notice about any any canceled or suspended privileges rather than DNR sending it for rec vehicles and then DPS sending it for motor vehicles. Um, they're going to get basically one stop shopping and, 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 and one one part of information. 2.6 to 2.8 is also conforming language and it just talks about um, um, what public safety is going to be doing um, some of that work um, and, and not DNR anymore. So just more conforming language. 2.9 to 2.14 is conforming language that deals with interlock. Um, and so it makes, uh, uh, again, rec vehicles the same as traditional motor vehicles. And then 2.15 all the way down to 2.19. That's just old language, um, but there is a little bit of rewrite just to make sure it's conforming with, um, with traditional motor vehicles. So that's section one. Um, section two is some cleanup language uh, in chapter 84. Um, it talks about um, uh, last year in a different DUI bill, conservation officers were given the authority to uh, write DUIs for traditional motor vehicles. And so some of the language you see that's being removed on 2.25 to 2.28 um, need to be repealed because we do have that authority now and we don't need that in statute anymore. Section three um, is also some cleanup. Um, about fines based on this conformity. And basically since uh, as you can see on, on line 2.31, since uh, 8491 um, has been repealed, that's been repealed 
are taken out of this as well. And there's just some more cleanup um, in this section. And then you see some new language on 3.1 to 3.4 um, that kind of ties back with uh, 97A065, which I'll talk about here in a little bit later in the bill where there's some cleanup. Section four is basically the same as section one. Section one dealt with ATVs, off-road vehicles, and snowmobiles. Section four does the exact same stuff, but for watercraft, because watercraft is found in chapter 86, where wrecked vehicles are found in chapter 84. So in the interest of time, I'll just say ditto from chapter section one, and, and we can move on, unless there's questions, obviously. Section five um, talks about, um, again, fines uh, and, and bail, and this is cleanup because uh, uh, chapter uh, 86B331 was repealed. There had to be some cleanup language in, the, in where that money goes. Um, section six uh, looks like a lot of stuff, but it really some of it is it's, it's just cleanup. So if you look at line 4.15 to 4.17, since we did make the changes in uh, section one with uh, wrecked vehicles and where that where those fines go, it was somehow placed in game and fish law many years ago. So we're taking that out of game and fish law and keeping that over in chapter 84 where it should be. 4.18 to 4.24 is, is language um, that's like 20 years old that should have been changed probably 20 years ago. So many years ago at the turn of the century, uh, uh, the counties actually ran all the courts. And so when um, fines came in, the county had to give money to the state. Um, back 20 years ago, the state took over the court process. So this is just clean up language that should have been cleaned up a long time ago. Same with uh, lines 4.27 to 4.32 and uh, 5.1 to 5.3. That's all that old language um, when the counties used to run the courts. Section seven is getting into DUI law. Um, the work that was done in section one and section four allows um, a number of subdivisions in 169A to be repealed. And so in the repealer, you'll see um, 169A, 1B and 1C um, being repealed. And so there's just a little bit of cleanup language on 1, 5.7 to 5.8 um, to address what has been done um, previously. And then you can also see some of that cleanup language because of those repealers on 5.25 to 5.31. Um, and then 6.3 to 6.8 is just conforming um, language because of those repeals. 6.9, section 10, um, that's conforming language when it comes to impaired driving. 171 um, is in relation to driver's license and that's the statutes where you'll find a lot of stuff around driver's licenses. Um, section 11 is more conformity uh, with interlock with driver's licenses. And then section 12 is the revisor's instructions um, because uh, DUI law is a little complicated. I like to think of it sometimes as a Rubik's cube when you move things a little bit. Uh, sometimes the revisor has to help clean things up a little bit and they did a great job on this. And, and this is just allowing the revisor to make some cleanup if needed. And then section 13 is the repealer um, for some of the th things that are being repealed and touched on. So with that, I can stand for questions. Thank you, Colonel Smith, for, for walking us through the bill. Um, members, any questions on the bill? Give it a minute here and see if any hands go up. Representative Heinzman. I think maybe we should have uh, Colonel Rodman Smith come in and uh, do a walkthrough on all our bills. I don't know that we would have any questions. Nice job. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions, members? I'm not seeing any hands raised. So Representative Becker Finn, any closing remarks? Uh, appreciate member support. It's a good bill. Thank you. And thank you to Colonel Smith. All right. Representative Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 695 be recommended to be re-referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Finance and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll on the motion. Wazowick, Amy. Wazlowick, aye. Wazlowick, aye. Heinzman and Josh. Aye. Heinzman, aye. Aiko and Patty. Aye. Aiko, aye. Acklin, Susan. Aye. Acklin, aye. Backer, Jeff. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Eklund, Rob. Aye. 
I put into I. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, I. Fisher, I. Green, Steve. I. Green, I. I go, Spencer. I go, I. I go, I. Jordan, Sydney. I. Jordan, I. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, I. Keeler, I. Lee, Fu. Lee, I. Me, I. Uh, Lewick, Dale. Lewick, I. Lewick, I. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson, I. Nelson, I. Tice, Tama. Tama, I. Tice, I. And that is 17 eyes and zero nays. All right. The motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the Criminal Justice Reform Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Ackland, I see your hand up. Did you have a question? I, I just have one question. I just I was just noticing something and maybe it's too late, but I would like this clarified. So under 5.21, um, driving while impaired, uh, under section seven, driving while impaired motor vehicle, the number seven, um, it looks like it, it, the person, so it says within this, um, let, me, let me just back up. It is a crime for any person to drive, operate, or be in physical control of any vehicle as defined in these sections and talks about alcohol controlled substances, et cetera, et cetera. Then number seven, the person's body contains any amount of a controlled substance listed in schedule one or two, or it's metabolite other than marijuana or THC. So are they, is this excluding somebody that's under the influence of marijuana or THC? I see Representative Beckerfin has her hand up. Representative Beckerfin. Um, that, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And if you'll notice that that's not the part that's being underlined or crossed out. So there are no changes uh, in 695 that have to do um, with that line of the statute. So, so it's not a change, but that's in there that currently that is excluded. Am I, am I interpreting this correct? And I, I'm just asking, am I interpreting this correct? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, yes, that, that I, I guess that is the, that is the underlying statute. And I would encourage you to talk with uh, house research if you have additional questions, but again, um, 695 doesn't make any changes here. Madam Chair. Representative Ackland. Is it too late to change my vote? Yes, it is. That's what I'm Thank hearing. You. Thank you. All right, members, we will move on to the next bill on the agenda. Um, and that is House File 1489. Um, and since I don't believe Chair Hansom is back yet, I'm going to move um, that House File 1489 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. And um, we do have folks from the DNR here who are going to walk through the bill um, to present, present the bill and answer any questions. And I have um, Ms. Shilcox here to do that. Ms. Shilcox, you're on mute. How's that? Good. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Jenny Shilcox. I supervise the DNR's Land Use Programs Unit, which is housed in the um, Division of Ecological and Water Resources. And the Land Use Programs Unit houses the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area Program, which is um, the program that is the subject of this bill. So this bill proposes to amend uh, Minnesota statute section 84.027 to provide the DNR with statutory authority to conduct expedited rulemaking for changes to district boundaries um, that are set in the rules for the Mississippi River Corridor critical area. And we often refer to the Mississippi River critical area as the MRCA. So I'm going to use that term moving forward. Uh, for background, for members of the committee who may not be familiar with the MRCA, um, it is a statutorily designated corridor of land uh, along the Mississippi River in the Twin Cities Metro, and it, it extends from Dayton and Ramsey 
in the north down to just south of Hastings. Uh, the corridor was designated by the state in 1973 as a state critical area. And it is governed by special land use um, development regulations that are set in rule and implemented through local plans and zoning ordinances. There are 30 cities, counties, and townships in the critical area, uh, about 27 of which administer MRCA zoning ordinances. So the DNR completed rules for the MRCA in 2017, and these rules established districts that determine things like um, structure height, setbacks from the river and bluffs, and um, they lay out a process for local governments to request changes to the districts. However, because the districts are established in rule, it requires rulemaking to make any of those changes. Um, and rulemaking can be a very long and complicated and costly process. So as we worked with local governments to develop the rules back in 2017, and in our ongoing work with them to implement the rules through their local plans and ordinances, uh, they have repeatedly expressed support and a desire to have a more streamlined approach for um, making those district changes that is more responsive to the time that they have to operate under. Um, so this was very important to local governments from the get-go and we actually expressed our intention to seek expedited rulemaking for these district changes in the statement of uh, need and reasonableness or the sonar for the rules. So currently any district change that would have to go um, to the DNR would go through the general rulemaking process outlined in chapter 14. By giving the DNR authority for expedited approach, we'll be able to save more money and time in responding to these requests while still ensuring a public process. So I just want to close by saying that this is a proposal really driven by local governments who administer the Merca rules, and it will allow the DNR to be more responsive to those local district changes uh, while still ensuring public process and compliance with the rules. So with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Shilcox. Um, any member questions on the bill? See a couple of hands, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, question for, uh, for the testifier. Uh, I, maybe I missed it. I didn't hear you mention counties uh, as well involved in the zoning uh, land use process. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, some townships, some municipalities uh, do that uh, exclusively. But uh, is the county involved in this? And do they have a, an input, uh, any of the counties along that corridor? Ms. Chilcox. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Look. Uh, yes, there are five counties in the corridor. Of those, only two, Washington and Dakota, have uh, MRCA ordinances. Um, they share responsibility with the town, the unincorporated townships, mm -hmm. so the Denmark Township in Washington County and uh, Ravenna in Ninninger Township. And they were all involved uh, with the rulemaking mm -hmm. and uh, they have also been involved in work groups that we've held since the rulemaking as we're implementing the, um, as local governments are updating their plans and their ordinances. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess, uh, any, do you have any idea why not all the counties are involved? It's, it's, they just simply don't have jurisdiction over those sections of the corridor, is that, is that why? That's, that's correct. The other counties are Anoka, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey, and they have no zoning authority. They're fully incorporated. Uh, all right, uh, Representative Green, I see your hand next. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of questions for testifier or anybody who can answer them. Um, is there has there been any opposition to uh, uh, to some of the prog or, uh, policies that have been enacted and some of the rules that have been put in place? Ms. Shilcox. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Green. Uh, no, actually this process has been going very seamlessly. All, uh, but I believe one community have updated their comprehensive plans to be compliant with the rules. And we started notifying uh, cities 
and some townships to start uh, amending their ordinances. And that's going very smoothly. We started in January 2020, and a couple of communities have already adopted their ordinances, and the other, many are underway, and there has been no controversy uh, that has been brought to our attention since then. Representative Green. So thank you, Madam Chair. So in the, in the past, then for any other uh, um, changes that were made by rule, have, have any of them been controversial at all? Ms. Cox. Um, could, could you repeat the question? I apologize. I'm not sure I'm understanding what the question is. Well, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Thank you. The, um, you on your testimony, you said that uh, the, the process now is, is made by rule. And so it has to continue to be made by rule. So have any, has there been uh, any controversy, any pushback in the past through this whole process? Ms. Shelcox. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Green. There, one of the shortcomings of the initial executive order that established the corridor was that it established four districts that were very static and there was no mechanism for changing them. So as, um, as land use changed, you know, the Metropolitan Council expanded metropolitan urban services. There were new goals for more diverse housing, transit oriented development. Uh, a lot of those four districts just didn't apply anymore. And that was a problem going into the rulemaking. So there was a lot of concern when we went into the rulemaking in 2017 that communities be able to be, or, you know, um, have that ability to change districts to meet their needs and other growth pressure while still meeting the intent of the regulations. So this aspect of the rules was never very controversial. It was um, identified as a need very early on to be able to be responsive to changes and have some mechanism so that things weren't just kind of locked in time. I'm not sure if that is answering your question, but um, you know, there, there certainly over the years has been a lot of interest in the critical area, but this particular aspect with the districts um, has not been. Representative Green. Thank you. I see that uh, Representative Heinzman has a question too, so I'm just going to end with a comment instead of asking more. Um, I see uh, this, uh, uh, these kind of uh, issues come forward more and more. And, and so what, uh, what I hear from both agencies and, and uh, other entities is that the process is just too hard or it just takes too long. And so let's cut some corners, let's, let's kind of squeeze out the people so that they have less say and less knowledge of what's going on. Uh, these, these policies that we have or these uh, rulemaking uh, rule um, laws that we have are designed for public input, they're not supposed to be easy. Not it's not supposed to be pushed through uh, in the in the quickest fashion possible. I do not like this bill. I think that uh, I think that this could come back to bite the area, uh, the people in the area. Um, uh, they will they will see things going through and wonder how they passed. And uh, I hope uh, I hope it doesn't come back to get you in the end. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was going to ask Steve's question just in a little bit different way. I see Commissioner Myers here, and uh, maybe Commissioner Meyer might help us better understand, I guess, two things. Uh, again, is there opposition that has prevented this from becoming law in the past? And, and maybe he could help us understand why that has become controversial. And I notice that uh, it doesn't have a companion in the Senate, so I'm, I'm wondering if uh, there's been difficulty there, and uh, I understand, you know, but Chair Hansen's not here, so it's his bill. He might know that, and I know I'm putting uh, Representative Jamie Becker in a spot, so maybe that's unfair. But if Bob could at least address the first question, and if Jamie Becker Finn has uh, some background, that would be great. It looks like Chair Hansen is back. I don't know, Chair Hansen, if you heard. Hey. Question. I, I didn't hear the question. I'm still trying to get my uh, computers in sync here. So, but I go ahead. Uh, um, 
I will Represent go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you know, so I was just wondering, uh, Representative Green was trying to find out if there's opposition to this language. And, and I think that not having a, a Senate companion was just raising some flags for him. And it, are you aware of where the pushback is coming from on this and what, what the difficulty in the past has been getting this done? Chair Hansen. Um, and you're, you're on the 1489? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. So I think um, I talked with Senator Rood this morning, and I think she's just got some jackets. So I'm not sure on um, it. It may have just not been dropped in yet. Um, I'm not sure on this particular one, but she said that she ha still has, she's still trying to get some things scheduled. So, and, and uh, bills dropped in. So that's just on why there may not be a Senate jacket. Um, this was a DNR policy bill. Uh, Ten years ago, when the original uh, Mississippi River critical area, I authored that bill, uh, Representative Heinzman. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any other members that were here during that uh, time. And it, I think it went to nine committees at the time. And it was controversial, but it also had a three year, I think it was three or maybe four years of implementation. It started in the Palenti administration the rulemaking and finally we extended the rulemaking and it went into the Dayton administration and was finalized. And uh, I worked with then Representative Abler, uh, who's now Senator Abler, uh, and all the kind of controversy got wrung out of it during the rulemaking. What this bill does is deals with expedited rulemaking. rulemaking. So I think the, uh, and this is on the borders within the critical area, um, that wasn't really the issue uh, in, in the past. It was, this originally was an executive order by Governor Cui in the 1970s. And so we went through the statute changes in the late aughts, and then the rulemaking took a very long time. And now they want to adjust uh, the borders of the zones within the rulemaking based on the science. Um, I, I think what all, if there are members who remember it, it's the memory of that rather than the current, any current controversy relating to this. I have heard no controversy uh, regarding this. I have communities that are in the, uh, in the critical area. Um, and I think this is just uh, providing for ease of updating those uh, particular zones. So I could be wrong on uh, uh, with uh, the Senate, but I think this is one that just didn't, hasn't been dropped in yet and maybe DNR uh, would would know more on that. I see Commissioner Meyer just came back. So Commissioner Meyer. Madam Chair, uh, members, again, for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Representative Hansen did a very good job of describing where we're at. There is no known controversy. Actually, the League of Minnesota Cities um, or the, the Metro Cities do support this provision. Really what it is, it's, 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 a, it's a streamlining effort for us to codify local government decisions through an expedited process for rulemaking. It doesn't make sense for us to, to go through a full-blown chapter 14 rulemaking process to update or to codify the decision of a local unit of government. So it's really an efficiency bill. And Representative Hansen did clearly identify this project. It, it started off very bumpy, but through the hard work of, of Ms. Shilcox and her staff, we were able to reboot the process and come up with something that, that works, that's very supported. And now we're just trying to streamline the end product of, of what we have accomplished in statute. So, and we're working very hard to get the bill uh, heard in the Senate to meet deadline and uh, go forward from there. Representative Heinzman. That helps a lot. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, members, any other questions on this bill? Don't see any hands going up. Representative Hansen, did you want to make some closing remarks? I know you just got back here. Chair Hansen, you're on mute. So we're not hearing your closing remarks there. Um, are, we're laying this one over. Or are we sending it to the? Um, this one is going to be placed on the general register. That's oh. the uh, I would ask for your uh, vote for support of this. I think it is a good streamlining. I'm not always for streamlining, but I think this one uh, 
does uh, provide, uh, it, it eliminates redundancy that is there and uh, would provide, uh, it would help our local units of government. All right, with that, Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 1489 be recommended to be placed on the general register. The clerk will take the roll. Hansen, Rick. Aye. Hansen, aye. Wozniak, Amy. Wozniak, aye. Wozniak, aye. Hansen and Josh. Aye. Hansen and aye. Aiko and Patty. Aye. Aiko and aye. Ackland and Susan. Ackland, aye. Ackland, aye. Backer, Jeff. Becker, no. Becker, no. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Becker. Uh, Eklund, Rob. Aye. Eklund, aye. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Green, Steve. No. Green, no. I go, Spencer. I go, aye. I go, aye. Jordan, Sibby. Aye. Jordan, aye. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Lee, Foo. Lee, aye. Lee I Lippert Todd. Lippert I. Lippert I Lewick Dale. Lewick I. Lewick I Morrison Kelly. Morrison I. Morrison I. Nelson Nathan. Nelson I. Nelson I. Tice Tama. Tice I. Tice I. That is 16 I's and two nays. All right. The motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the next stop. Um, next up, we have House File 1294. Um, Chair Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move House File 1294 and it be laid over for possible inclusion. Chair Hansen, um, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this bill relates uh, to an issue of water uh, and uh, how do we protect our water and make sure that our water is not uh, taken. Uh, this bill was introduced last year uh, by former Representative Waginius uh, and had some hearings. And I want to just walk through the bill. I know there are a number of testifiers uh, that uh, can provide good insight on the water. Uh, a key component here is a public meeting. So when we're when there's a large usage of water, and I know you're going to ask, where did the 216,000 gallons per day average in a 30-day period come from. That comes from 150 gallons a minute times 60 minutes times 24 hours. And that's uh, uh, the standard there. That's the where that dollar or that amount comes from. So when there's a large water use uh, for that permit for consumptive use, so that doesn't mean that we as humans are consuming it. It means that it's being taken and not replenished. Uh, there would be a public meeting. Um, and it has kind of the standard public meeting information. It also defines vintage groundwater. So this is groundwater that uh, with a tritium concentration. So a little bit about tritium with the atomic bomb testings in the 1950s and up until the nuclear test ban treaty of 1963, uh, that the bomb uh, uh, testings actually resulted in tritium uh, being distributed in the atmosphere. So we can tell age of, of water by looking at the tritium concentration. And tritium is, uh, has a half-life, I think about 12.4 years. So we can measure and age uh, water based on uh, its tritium contact. And then it provides for sustainability. So looking at that consumptive use for groundwater uh, looking at recharge. So we don't want to be uh, taking so much that uh, we don't have the groundwater supply to meet the needs of future generations. I would also just uh, note when we're talking about groundwater, there is a recent Supreme Court decision, uh, Minnesota Supreme Court looking at groundwater as drinking water. And I think that uh, essentially indicated what we know is that groundwater can become drinking water and we need to protect not only the quality, but the quantity uh, so that is, it isn't uh, taken or exported uh, for a different use. So that is the bill and I have a number of testifier, testifiers and I know we're running out of time, so I'll stop. All right, we do have a number of testifiers on the list. Um, and first up is Mike Slavic. You could introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Mike Slavik. I'm a Dakota County Commissioner, uh, and this proposed language is really an important step in the right direction, uh, providing more public involvement in large uh, appropriations and addressing sustainability. Uh, in Dakota County, 90% of our uh, drinking water comes from groundwater, uh, and Dakota County is one of the largest uh, counties for uh, largest users of agriculture uh, irrigation in the entire state of Minnesota. Uh, in addition, our groundwater ground, uh, drawdowns are predicted to uh, occur in some of our largest, fastest growing areas in the entire county, cities such as Lakeville, Apple Valley, Invergrove Heights, uh, and also in the southeast part of uh, the county, we are seeing large drawdowns in our agriculture from the irrigation. Um, this is most important to the Dakota County Board of Commissioners uh, because only about two years ago, uh, we were presented with an issue in the southern part of the county where a uh, private entity was looking to uh, draw, withdraw 500 million gallons of water um, every single year to go in and ship it by train down to the state of Arizona for irrigation purposes. And that has really uh, elevated the issue of the drawdowns within our uh, county, as well as uh, the concerns that there was not a public process for, uh, for, for some of that to happen. Fortunately, the DNR was able to step in due to uh, other state statutes, but we are very concerned of uh, what is happening with our groundwater within Dakota County and the state of Minnesota. Uh, and I, there is uh, additionally testifiers. We do have county staff if there are uh, questions for some uh, county experts on that. And otherwise, thank you very much for uh, your consideration, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Slavic. Um, next up on the list is Jason Mokel from the DNR. Mr. Mokel, if you can identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Jason Mokel, I'm a section manager within the Division of Ecological and Water Resources in the DNR. And um, we appreciate um, the testimony and, and the author's interest here in, in helping us do the best job for state citizens in Minnesota. There are some concerns that we have with the language in the bill that we thought um, would be helpful to share here today. Uh, and we're very much in favor of um, public engagement. We, we do host a lot of meetings about groundwater use throughout the state in places where we have a lot of uh, intensive water use. However, when we uh, evaluated the, um, the threshold here of the 216,000 gallons per day in a 30 day period, and we looked back at the number of permits we've issued over the last six to 10 years, we're, we're estimating that this is gonna require us to host 75 public meetings on average and as many as 100 public meetings a year. Um, there's a substantial amount of um, resources that would be needed to, to be able to do that and do a good job of it. And I believe you have a fiscal note that would identify that our estimate is about $423,000 a year just to host these public meetings. The other thing that we wanted to mention is the, um, the vintage groundwater um, provision is, we see it as problematic for a few reasons. Um, one is that the tritium uh, signal that Representative Hansen spoke to is actually fading out. And um, we, we are in active discussions with the USGS and other uh, geologic organizations as to what we're gonna be able to use in the future to age groundwater. Um, the signal for tritium essentially is gonna be uh, gone in another eight to 10 years. It's one that we rely on now and use for our county geologic atlases. So we know, relatively speaking, the, the age of the water and we classify that water as either um, uh, uh, modern, mixed or pre-modern. The, the other thing is that uh, we don't have age data uh, all the way around the state. Uh, the tritium signals are, the tritium samples are, are fairly expensive and we haven't even completed the atlases yet around the state. So in order for us to implement this, um, we're gonna be um, operating without the information that we need to be able to evaluate permits. And, and I can't emphasize enough that um, the this vintage, quote unquote, what we call pre-modern water is distributed all around the state of Minnesota. It shows up in bedrock aquifers uh, here in the, in the Twin Cities. It shows up in many of our quaternary aquifers around the state. Um, so we have a challenge here with trying to implement the, the tritium portion of this that um, we would have to, for one, greatly accelerate um, the tritium sampling that we do 
and we estimated that if we could double the effort that we currently have in about eight FTEs and $1.6 million per year, we might be able to get the tritium samples throughout the state. But even if we did that, the challenge that we're gonna have is when we go out and get a tritium sample from an aquifer, we're getting one location. When you pump groundwater from aquifers, you've got a lot of interactions going on. It'd be really, really hard for us to say that not going to do some mixing. And then I would just add that, you know, the fundamental principle of pumping groundwater is that you get recharge and that recharge is coming from above. So if we are going to be held to the standard of not allowing these aquifers to, to have um, water from above recharging deeper aquifers, then effectively what we're saying is we can't pump groundwater from these deeper aquifers. It's not to say we don't understand the intention here was to protect water quality. We understand that. We just don't think that this tool is, as it's currently crafted is, is um, uh, going get to us, uh, get us there. And then the last thing I'll just quickly add is that the um, adding the recharge language to sustainability, we, we don't think that that's really going to be clarifying. Um, it's not a technical term. We have rules in law that define safe yield uh, that we already use and apply to our aquifers. And uh, there are no situations in the state of Minnesota where we are currently experiencing the issue of safe yield, uh, where there are places where it's of concern. We're working with appropriate local communities to manage those concerns. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the sustainability component of that, which is how the uh, pumping of groundwater is interacting with surface water features. Um, and, and the um, recharge is critical to that, but that's recharge that's typically happening, happening at, the, at the water table level. Um, I know you're sh running short of time, so I'll, I'll end there and just see if there are any follow-up questions. Thank you. All right, um, next on the list, I have Jason Halverson. If you could introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Madam Chair, uh, I'm Jason Halverson, farmer from the uh, Bonanza, Valley, Bonanza Valley area in central Minnesota. Uh, um, I would just like to say that I have uh, many concerns with this bill and its language. Um, we live here, we farm here, we raise our families in this area. Um, if anyone's going to be affected by over pumping or uh, pumping up any contaminated water, it's going to be us first. We're right here. Um, so with that, I don't see how adding more regulation is going to benefit anyone in this area. Um, irrigation has a huge economic benefit to this area. Um, so I, I guess uh, I'm not in favor of this bill uh, whatsoever. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic that is very, very important uh, to myself and my family. Thank you. All right, thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Grant Anderson, and we'll get to member questions after testifiers. Uh, Mr. Anderson, if you can identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Grant Anderson. I too farm in the Bonanza Valley between Belgrade and Bruton. Uh, family farming operation. I have several concerns uh, with the bill, as uh, Mr. Meckel pointed out from the DNR. Uh, having to go through a public meeting, as I'm aware of when, uh, when we try to, uh, or when we apply for a uh, livestock facility permit, uh, these public meetings can become a free-for-all, if you will, from uh, people that uh, don't have much stake in the issue at hand. Uh, that's my big concern with the public meeting. It, it, anybody from the state could come to testify. And the DNR already has a, a scientific method, if you will, to making sure that uh, the pumping that we're going to do from the aquifer is sustainable and uh, that we're not going to cause damage to the aquifer. They have, uh, like I said, a scientific method that, that there's measured results. We have to do a pump test as part of the application process for a new irrigation permit. And those numbers are quantifiable and, uh, and can be reviewed. Uh, a public meeting is going to be nothing but a free-for-all for, 
uh, how do I say it, uh, for anyone opposed to commercial agriculture to testify against them. And, uh, and then, you know, it, at the end of the day, there's still real no teeth in the matter. The DNR is going to have the authority to grant or not grant that pumping permit. So I, I guess uh, regarding that public meeting, I, I just, I feel that it would just add more red tape regulation and uh, uh, time that agricultural producers uh, would have to try to fight the public to be able to operate out in greater Minnesota. So uh, regarding the sustainability standard and the consumptive use of groundwater, like I said before, the DNR already has a set of data points in place uh, that can be measured. So to try to put an arbitrary statement in there is to say that the groundwater needs to be sustainable for the needs of future generations really doesn't have any teeth and or metrics that, uh, that can be measured. So for those reasons, uh, uh, I, I'm opposed to the bill. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, we have Lee Hansen. Mr. Hansen, if you would identify yourself for the record and then present your testimony. Mr. Hansen, you are muted. I'm not sure if you're talking, I can't see. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. <clears throat> My name is Lee Hansen. I'm the attorney for the Minnesota Irrigators Association. Um, as the previous speakers have already all said, this issue is dealt with by the rules and the regulations of the DNR before any irrigation well, which is what we're really uh, concerned about, can be, uh, we can get a permit for, we have to do a monitoring well and we have to do a pumping test. And so this is just another added expense and, and another uh, process that will slow down and increase the cost of obtaining irrigation for farmers. Um, and it's going in exactly the opposite way that uh, we, you were trying to do in the last bill where you were streamlining the process. And as Jason Meckel said, uh, this adds a lot of cost to your own agencies. Um, and I don't think it's going to uh, provide any more protection uh, than you already have with the regulations that the DNR has in place. So I, I think not only will it add costs for the DNR, it adds significant costs for the farmers that are going to be utilizing these permits. And um, the Irrigators Association is happy to work with the DNR to make sure that they have the proper tools in place to evaluate these issues. And all the issues that uh, have been raised here today are already measured by the rules and regulations and standards set by the DNR. And I think Jason Meckel made a good point of that. So I don't, that's really all I have is it's, it's an added cost that doesn't provide any more protection or benefits than we, I think the state already has with the rules and regulations that are in place by the DNR. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, for your testimony. Um, next up, we have Jake Wildman. If you could introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony, and uh, then we'll get to member questions. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Jake Wildman. I am from Glenwood, Minnesota. Um, I irrigate and farm up here in the Glenwood area, Bonanza Valley. Um, I am the president of the Irrigator Association of Minnesota, and uh, I, for the sake of time, I will just express the same concerns of this bill as the previous testimonies. Um, I just, I think it's uh, uh, more regulation, um, more red tape to jump through. So um, I don't have a lot of extra comments. Um, I just would like to agree with uh, the previous testimonies and express my concerns. And I just thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wildman, and we will move on to member questions. I have Representative Jordan and then Representative Wippert. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm really glad we have this public meeting to hear from everyone about proposed changes that affect all of us here in Minnesota. My question is for Mr. Meckel from the DNR and it's regarding this fiscal note. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you're conducting public meetings um, in the past 12 months? 
Mr. Meckel. Madam Chair, members, um, Representative Jordan, um, we, uh, we've been using uh, WebEx most recently. And uh, as a matter of fact, Wednesday morning, we had the most attendance we've had at a groundwater um, area meeting up in the uh, uh, Park Rapids area, the Straight River. We had um, over 40 members of the public, so not state agency staff that participated in that meeting. Uh, it was an hour and a half long on WebEx and we talked about the data and the water quality concerns and issues. We had the Department of Ag there talking about nitrogen and what they're doing with the nitrogen fertilizer management plan. Um, we've had a um, meeting in the East Metro for the White Bear Lake area. Uh, we've been having public meetings um, with contamination concerns in the East Metro as well. So we've been relying on, on our um, uh, online platforms to, um, to connect with the public. And, and, and in fact, we've seen, interesting enough, greater participation because of it. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so then, Mr. Meckel, can you do you think you'll can since it's been so successful to have these online meetings? Do you think you'll continue to do online engagement for public meetings? Mr. Meckel. Madam Chair, Representative Jordan, um, you know it's yet to be seen. There, there's an element of uh, in-person meetings that we also greatly appreciate, and and several of the folks here have testified that we've been meeting with them in person for a number of years, and developing those relationships is important. Um, I don't know that the online way is going to be able to replace everything. As you all know, it adds it adds value, but it adds complexity and difficulties as well. So I think that's an active conversation as to how do we how do we adjust going forward? Because I think there's going to be an expectation people appreciate the ability to connect this way, but they also appreciate the ability to connect in person. Uh, so how we do that in the future once we get through this pandemic is yet to be determined. One final Jordan. Thank you. One final question, Madam Chair. Can you talk to me about how you calculated this fiscal note for the cost of meetings then, considering you don't know how you're going to be conducting meetings going forward and there might be a change in cost from online versus completely face-to-face -face meetings? Mr. Meckel. Hey, Madam Chair and Representative Jordan, we used our past experience of in-person meetings, um, staff time to plan those meetings, to organize the facilities, to uh, prepare the materials, uh, the information that's necessary to effectively communicate what's being proposed and what our analysis of that proposal is, um, that actually ends up being considerably more time than the, the out meeting itself. Um, but we used our past experience to, to inform those estimates and then assumed that we'd have some sort of an in-person element. We'd need to travel to that location. Um, now, we have staff around the state, but, you know, so it's just, it's a ballpark estimate and you know, not knowing exactly where and when. So it, Madam Chair, Representative Jordan. So it doesn't take into account uh, things we've learned about online um, public meetings over the past year and the changes in things like printing versus emailing. Mr. Meckel. Madam Chair and members, um, we typically don't print out materials to bring to public meetings. We typically rely on some sort of a visual presentation, make that information available online. Um, you know, if we go to online only for all of these kinds of meetings, then conceivably we would save some aspect of the travel cost, but the overwhelming majority of the cost for hosting a public meeting is all the preparation going into it. Uh, Representative Jordan, I just, we do have to move on to other members. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam um, Chair. Representative Lippert and then Representative Lewick. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to thank the chair for bringing this bill forward. So my district borders Dakota County. Uh, my house is less than a mile from Dakota County. I know uh, farmers who farm in Dakota County who depend on irrigation in Dakota County and uh, can share that um, folks in my area were, were universally alarmed that the water train issue came up and were asking, uh, you know, what, what happens if we don't do anything uh, to stop this? And, and, and is this going to keep happening? Where we have to uh, try to try to stop uh, water from being shipped out, and you know what kind of safeguards uh, will be in place for us. So um, I just want to express that concern that that's what I'm hearing here, and I just ask that of the bill author. You know what what the question that my constituents are asking: What happens if we don't do anything right now? 
Chair Hanson. Madam Chair, um, I think they'll be back. I think that there will be more proposers. Maybe it won't be just Dakota County. Maybe they'll go to the Bonanza Valley. They could go other places. Um, and the question of existing rules and statute, would they hold up in court? And so the, what we're talking about here is protecting all of Minnesota's groundwater. And that I think pay very close attention to uh, Commissioner Slavic's testimony, because we often look at, at, at it from our district or from our personal use or for our personal business. But as state representatives, we've got to look at the whole. And so um, water issues, what is the price of water? As human beings, we have to have water and we have to have good water as human beings ourselves. So what is the price for that? How do we protect that? And I understand what, represent, or what Mr. Mickel was saying on uh, the decay on tritium, but if we're drawing down those top surficial aquifers into the deep wells, if we're pulling that water down, that shows there's a lot of water going out. So I'm hopeful that we can find the right amount here and the right science to make sure that we are protecting our water from losing it, both in terms of quantity or quality. And so I look forward to those ongoing discussions. I think the public hearing is critical because if there are large amounts of water being taken and you start to add those together, you have some consequence. This is not just a question of the me, this is a question of the we. And we've got to try and find a way. I'm open to working with uh, people uh, throughout the state on trying to resolve this because I think it is something that affects all the state. And I think with Zoom and with electronic communication, as Mr. Mickel said, we can have more people involved in helping craft good protections for our citizens. I do see Mr. Meckel's hand up. Did you, Mr. Meckel, did you want to chime in on this? Thank you, Madam Chair members. Just briefly, I, I want to mention, we, we certainly share the concerns that um, were um, illuminated when the water train proposal came forward. And we've worked uh, with the attorney general's office and our house attorney and uh, I know we're not hearing it today, but I would direct your attention to House File 1491, Companion Bill, Senate File 1110. We've proposed some language that we think gives us the additional tools that we need to um, both say no to uh, export of water, but also to, to protect Minnesota's water supply for the future. So it was a careful, very carefully uh, crafted language, like I said, with the Attorney General's Office and our House Attorney. Um, and, you know, if, um, if and when that bill gets heard, we'd be happy to talk some more about it. All right, next up, I have Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess first I, I want to comment when we, uh, uh, cons and this is particularly for those people that are on this committee that are not actively involved in agriculture. Uh, and have a, a fair understanding of the industry. I want you to just, colleagues, please take a look um, at the faces of those three uh, testifiers. Uh, they mentioned uh, uh, that they farm for a living and uh, gauge how old they are. Uh, these are three young uh, farm families. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, that they've had to come forward and stand up uh, uh, because they certainly uh, have concerns about this bill. And what is one of the biggest issues we have in agriculture uh, is attracting young uh, families. And I, they were very careful to kind of tiptoe around the business of public hearings. And, and I want to be very clear. Uh, we have seen existing process on public hearings for a, a new permit to irrigate 
turn into an inquisition. And let me repeat that again. A public inquisition directed toward the permit applicant where young farm families were hounded, harassed, mm -hmm. insulted, literally were concerned about their personal safety. And this wasn't coming from their friends and neighbors. This was coming from folks uh, that were hundreds of miles away that uh, frankly uh, uh, were certainly not directly impacted uh, by a single irrigating permit for a piece of farmland. Uh, the other comment I'll have is pretty clear that this legislation is so far behind the science or disconnected from the legitimate sciences. We understand how aquifers work. Uh, I think it's a, it's a concern that uh, it needs to go back on the shelf and, uh, and be brought up to date with uh, what we are doing. So I just want to ask the bill author, this bill is intended to be laid over. Do we have your uh, agreement that you're not going to stuff this into a bill without this going to the Agriculture Committee for a full uh, vetting because that's where we really deal with irrigation. And I would just really be concerned that if by laying this over, we're going to allow this to sit there and then jam it by the Ag Committee without uh, the real uh, expertise uh, vetting this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the DNR has the responsibility for the irrigation permits and that's within the jurisdiction of this committee. The uh, issue here, the issue, Representative Lewick, you know, you're looking at this through the lens of a use. There are other uses that may be a higher use for water that would take water. And so what if, what if they take the water? What if somebody else takes the water? As representatives, we have the responsibility to represent our districts. We are all equal. We all have constituents. We all have constituents with, we have young businesses. We have people who built new homes. We have people in old homes. We all are equal. The attempt here, we are going to lay it over to continue to work on it. I'd be happy to continue with work with you, to work with you, work with any member of this committee, and get input from the public as we lay it over. This is a public hearing. This is a public process. We are not moving it out today. We are going to continue to work on it, and we are going to produce a result that comes out uh, and will be voted on by the Minnesota House. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, guess, I guess I'll kind of dig through that comment and say the, your assumption is you're going to go straight to the House floor, uh, but please uh, consider that uh, that water, uh, at least on the agriculture side, uh, eventually manifests itself in some type of food stock for humans and, uh, and uh, uh, animals that we may consume in the, you know, so it's, it's uh, very easy to make this a global issue, uh, but there's a lot of pieces there. The second thing is there's another area over in commerce because you're right, uh, water is used for a lot of other manufacturing processes. So I would suggest that not only uh, would we be just jamming this through without really vetting it, if it uh, wouldn't be thoroughly looked at by the agriculture committee, but we should be looking at it in commerce too, because there's a lot of industries uh, uh, that do consume water to produce uh, uh, goods and services that uh, that we need. Uh, and again, my biggest concern here is that this this bill is so far behind the science. I understand a little bit about how uh, things relative to to uh, radioactive substances uh, work, uh, and I understand half lives. And uh, so the tritium issue is. Uh, <laughs> it's it's history uh, and it's going to be gone and, and it, it'll have no literally no value. Uh, so we need to do some research in that area. But again, I, I think that uh, I'm I'm still concerned. Your answer was this is <laughs> this is this is ready for apparently uh, uh, for the House floor. I I would certainly disagree in that. Uh, uh, 
uh, with that. But again, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will just echo what Representative Hansen said. The bill is being laid over. There is an opportunity for folks to chime in and, and get, get to a better place with the language. Um, Chair Hansen, did you want to address? I think uh, using words like jamming it through, uh, we've just spent time on this and we're laying it over for more input. And I would just encourage members to think about using words that uh, are not accurate. All right, next up I have Representative Fisher and then Representative Tice. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my first question would be to uh, Mr. Meckle. Mr. Meckle, what is the highest priority for uh, allocation of water and water allocation priorities that the state has in permitting? Mr. Meckle. Madam Chair and members, uh, the highest priority in, in statute is domestic water consumption. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Meckle. So that takes priority over, you know, with that being number one, it's the number one use for water being allocated to the state. So the way I understand what Representative Hansen is trying to do, and I very much appreciate his bill being brought forward here, is to create a discussion because while we had the water train issue come up in Dakota County, there's nothing that would prevent one of the Western states saying, we need more water for our local communities. It is cheaper to go to Minnesota, buy the water and ship it out. So tomorrow, there's nothing that would prevent one of those communities saying, we're going to apply for a permit for 500 million gallons from the Bonanza water area. And there is no open meeting process or anything else. This is for the number one use for domestic because there's nothing in statute saying that it's domestic use for Minnesota only. So it's domestic use could be anywhere in the country. So they could come in, make an application and then say, we're number one use. If you have to take permits away from farmers, you're gonna to have to take permits away from farmers and farmers then would lose that opportunity because they're not the number one use. They're the number three use in water statute. So I think it's very important that we have the public part uh, hearing place in there because there are times where farmers are gonna need that because they're not the number one use in the state, domestic uses, and it's domestic use could be interpreted by the courts anywhere in the country. So I wanna say thank you, Representative Hansen, for bringing this forward to allow the public to have a say in it because I think the farmers would wanna have a say in that, that if they're finding out they're not at the top anymore. And also more important, I appreciate the other bills you have that are coming forward to help address this issue. Thank you. Representative Tice and then Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, probably just a few comments, but I'm really most interested in the, oh, I got the wrong mouse here, uh, the last line of the bill. So that would be on line 2.7. When determining whether a compre presumptive use of groundwater is unstable, the commissioner must make a determination that the level of recharge to the aquifer impact is significant to replenish the groundwater supply to meet the needs of future generations. Um, probably Mr. Meckel, you can help me out on this one. How is that done? Mr. Meckel. Madam Chair and members, um, first of all, I, I need to explain that you cannot actually directly measure recharge. So, the way that we understand recharge is to use the monitoring wells, the network that we have in the state of Minnesota, which is up to a, a 1,150 wells now. And we are able to track water level change over time. So that's how we understand whether or not the aquifers are going down, going up or stable. Um, when it comes to evaluating individual permits, we use groundwater science to calculate the amount of drawdown that is expected from a proposed well. And then we're able to compare that with the data that we have in the area to determine whether or not we're gonna see uh, more drawdown than the aquifer can replenish. Um, so just, or then is, then is being replenished. In addition, um, and this is the case in the places where we have some real intensive water use, we have developed some very sophisticated water budget models in the East Metro, Little Rock Creek area. We're working on that for Dakota County. Uh, we're working on one for the Bonanza Valley and eventually the Strait River. Um, and, and the whole Metro already has a groundwater model developed by uh, the Met Council uh, and their consultants. 
so that we're able to look at these issues over the long term. But these tend to be very localized situations that we have to evaluate within a, a mile, couple of miles, three miles, four miles of proposed appropriations. Um, our network is the key to us being able to do that, that monitoring network. Representative Tice. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Michael. I guess what I'm what I'm hearing is it could just be a once in a lifetime thing. So my question is, is there a process to go back and check some of these and say, hey, it's not as bad as we thought it was? Um, and to make sure that we are, you know, helping out the folks that are farming in that area. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> I'm sorry, is there a process to go back and check it out? Mr. Meckle. Madam Chair and members, um, yes, about 10 years ago, we started publishing on a, on a five-year basis, a water level trends map for the state of Minnesota. And we're relying on places where we have sufficient number of years that we can actually statistically determine a trend. As you all can imagine, the water levels in our aquifers go up and down and track very much what happens with our climate. Um, and so we have now a map, you'll see this in a report that this legislature, well, not this legislature, but previous legislatures require the DNR publishes this report. It's a water availability and assessment report. And the uh, report is due every five years. We update that map every five years. And it tells us where we have declining water levels, where they're stable and where they're increasing. Um, I can share that map uh, with, with members to make it readily available. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess our any of our farmers still on or have they uh, gone back to work? I see a few, I think they're all still here. Okay. At least their names are still on the screen, whether they're there or not. Okay. I'm just, I would just like one of them and I'm not really sure who's who's here. Maybe, okay, I'm Mr. gonna pick. An Mr. Anderson has indicated that he's here. Okay. How about Mr. Anderson then? Um, just ask if, if what they do for their uh, water um, oh, I'm sorry, I, my allergies are terrible and my brain is fogged. Uh, could, could somebody just talk to me what your process is on, on a, like a yearly basis or a daily basis, please, Mr. Anderson? Mr. Anderson? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, I would imagine you're referring to an irrigation permit. And uh, so the DNR, before we drill a well, the DNR issues a preliminary ear, uh, uh, drill assessment. And uh, then if we were to drill the well, then we have to submit the pumping records to the DNR. And then we're, you know, after review, they will either uh, uh, accept or deny our permit. And uh, once we have a pumping permit in place, then we have to uh, report the gallons pumped by month uh, through that irrigation system uh, to the DNR on a yearly basis. I don't know if that answers your question uh, as to uh, kind of the normal usage of the water. Representative Tice, this is, uh, uh, I do, thank you. I just basically just wanna make a comment and uh, I just wanna thank the young men that are here representing our farming industry. I come from a farming background and that my grandpa was a farmer. And I also have several different uh, in-laws and nephews that that farm as well and I know it's not an easy task because there are so many different things hitting them at so many different oh angles that it is just uh it's it's ironic and I wonder too what part does any type of farming um entrepreneurship happen when when we make it sound like at any moment we're going to shut their water off I think of by Bruton, uh, we have Redheaded Creamery. That is an awesome place to go, uh, not only to be with friends, but also to have some great cheese. It is amazing cheese. And I think of what we as people um, participate with when we go to different countries and, and it just feels so restrictive right now. But I think that last line just scares me half to death that it is nothing scientific it is a determination. And that alone just horrifies me. Thank you. Thank you for all you farmers for, for what you do. And thank you, Lee, for taking care of them on an association level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, I think I see that Commissioner Meyer is still on the line. And um, I read a news story and I'd just like to confirm uh, because there's been a lot of questions around uh, this, uh, I guess, proposal that water would be shipped out of the state. So Commissioner Meyer, my question would be, uh, is there any scenario where DNR under current law um, would be uh, providing permits to ship water out of the state? So what I'm driving at is, uh, are you able to stop that under existing statute? I'm not sure if Commissioner Meyer is available. Mr. Meckel looks like he might be able to answer the question. Mr. Meckel. Madam Chair and members, Representative Heinzman, I, I think there was two ways you asked that question. So is there a way that we can stop? Yes. And, and that's what happened in Dakota County. Um, however, the, the bill that I mentioned, um, 1491, uh, and its companion in the Senate, has some language in it that we think gives us the additional tool that if the situation had been different, um, if the location had been different, um, saying no to that particular request might have been different. That's not to say, I'm not saying it would have been different, but it might have been because every permit application has to be evaluated whether or not it meets statute and rule. Um, so there's a lot of hypotheticals that we could play. The, the, the bill language that I'm referring to limits the transfer of water or bulk transfer or sale of water to 50 miles. Transfer or sale. 100 miles within the state of Minnesota if you are a public water supplier. The purpose of that is to make sure that our rural water districts are able to provide water within their area of the state, particularly in the Southwest. Um, and what this does is it stays compliant with the interstate commerce laws where we cannot treat um, an applicant from out of state different than you would a Minnesota applicant. Madam Chair. Should we work Representative with Hensman, if you can quickly, we need to wrap up here by 10 o'clock. Yep, I will, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just wanna quickly point out that it, it, it seems very clear, DNR has stated in news stories and we're hearing confirmed today that current law is uh, providing the opportunity to stop the transport of water in the way that would cause some concern, it seems. And the other thing I wanted to point out is we have numerous folks from our friends in the Agriculture Committee testifying here today against this bill. It causes them a great amount of concern. And we do not have some company seeking to take our water in the dark of night here uh, testifying against this language. It's our Minnesota farmers who are scared to death of this language. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Chair Hansen, any closing remarks on the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I think uh, two things. Uh, uh, Representative Tice, uh, I'm glad you brought up section three because the additional language actually provides a standard and clarification uh, to existing law. And Mr. Meckel uh, validated that they do have the monitoring uh, to do that. Secondly, I would encourage all members and the public to go back and listen to Representative Fisher's questions and, uh, and analysis because um, the, the minority seems to have focused only on the agricultural use. And even the DNR recognizes with other language that the status quo in terms of protection for water is not sufficient because they proposed additional language. So what we're trying to do here is provide a standard of protecting our water and have the public meetings. The public meetings are a critical component of this legislation to provide for protecting and involving the public in those decisions that affect all of our water, groundwater and drinking water. I would renew my notion to lay the bill over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 1294 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, the bill is laid over and unless Chair Hansen has any announcements. Nope, you can adjourn.
All right, then we are adjourned. The 2021-22 Green Book is here. The members directory of the Minnesota Legislature includes House and Senate member information, committee schedules and assignments, and other legislative information. Call House Public Information Services for your free copy at 651-296-2146, or you can request a copy via email at info at house.mn.